All right, welcome to the Decent Innovation Gym SolidWorks CAM tutorial video. Uh, today we're going to go over how to use SolidWorks CAM, which is a uh, CAM software built directly into SolidWorks. Uh, for those of you that don't know, CAM is uh, the way that we turn a uh, three-dimensional part file in S SolidWorks or any other 3D modeling software into G-code for a uh, 3D printer or a CNC mill to use. Uh, this CAM software is kind of that middle ground and it's required if we ever want to turn our 3D models into real physical parts. Uh, for SolidWorks CAM, the really big advantage is that we can use SolidWorks CAM directly in SolidWorks overall. Um, so what we have here is just an open new part with nothing created. I'm going to go over the really quick basics on making a simple part that we can do a test for, um, but it should be noted that this is not a SolidWorks tutorial. If you want to use SolidWorks CAM, you will probably need some SolidWorks experience beforehand. Uh, so I would recommend the SolidWorks tutorials that are included on their website, or uh, the Decent Innovation Gym YouTube channel will have a SolidWorks tutorial video that should be able to help you with getting some of this stuff figured out so that you can actually uh, use SolidWorks CAM and, and what we're going to cover today. But the basic part we're going to make is a just a little box with a circle cut out of the middle of it, just as an example for how to do a simple cut on the Tormac. Uh, we're going to start with a sketch on the top plane, do a rectangle off, and I'm going to make it 4 inches by 4 inches just so it's really easy and simple. Uh, then we're going to extrude it out to one inch tall and then go back to this face and put in a circle right in the middle of the part. So now that we have a circle created, let's make that circle one inch uh, as well. We can get rid of the lines, extrude, cut this circle back in, and we're going to put that in only half an inch so that it's got a little bit of depth in there. We can make that cut. Now that we're here, we've got our part done. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save it just so that we've got something we know. It's in case anything goes wrong from here on out, we're good to back things up to this step. But uh, now that we've got the part, we're going to go over into the SolidWorks CAM tab up here. Um, if it's not there, you need to make sure in SolidWorks settings, which should be under help. And then if SolidWorks CAM isn't there, that's probably a problem. But one thing you can do is go to my products and it would it should say SolidWorks CAM, either standard or professional is fine. Um, the dig should have professional, but if you have either one, we can do all the basic stuff we're going to cover today. If you don't see this checked, that means the SolidWorks license you're using does not come with SolidWorks CAM, and you're not going to be able to use it. Uh, luckily, most basic licenses for SolidWorks come with standard, so that should not be a problem for the majority of people out there. Now that we're here, though, in SolidWorks CAM, the first thing we need to do is make sure we're using the correct machine setup. So to do that, I want to go over to Technology Database up in the top, and this opens up our menu for most of the settings that we can use in SolidWorks CAM. Primarily, we're going to be working with mill stuff today, not turned. This is a whole other system that is difficult, uh, more difficult to use, and it's for different types of machines. Today, we're only working on milling. And uh, in the dig computers, we would see under machines the Tormac listed as one of the machines, and it would be pre-set up for us. But just as an example, I'll go into the default uh, inch. This is a three-axis mill. Um, and you, this is where you can change all the settings. We would have had this filled out in the dig with Tormac already listed. So you wouldn't need to worry about any of this, but you got to just make sure that this is all here and that you are setting yourself to the correct machine. Um, the other really important part of this is that you, you need to make sure your post-processor is correct. So that is the software that takes it from CAM, which is going to be a bunch of commands about where to move the bit on the part 
in three-dimensional space, and that post processor turns those commands into G code, and the specific G code that is created will change based on what machine you're using. So it's really important that you have the correct post processor, or you could end up with G code that either doesn't work in your machine or breaks your machine uh, entirely. But once you make sure this is all set up uh, correctly, um, it'll say Tormac on the post processor. Uh, we don't. I don't. Oh, this is my home computer, so I don't have that Tormac post processor here. But at the dig computers, there would be there. Once that's there, you should be good to go. You really won't need to mess around in this menu much at all. Um, and we ask that you do not change settings in this menu because this is the basic settings for the machine itself. And we don't want to be causing problems by accidentally increasing or decreasing stuff that's not supposed to change. Um, but it is helpful to know at least how to check to make sure you've got the right thing set. But once that's done, uh, you're pretty much done with technology database. Now we're going to go over to define machine up in the top left. And this is where we actually set which machine we're using. So right now we're already set to the mill inch. But let's say the Tormac was down here. We can select that. I'm going to go up here, though, because this is the one I'm, I'm pre preset to for this part. And you just hit select. Make sure you're selecting to the correct mill. Um, and then this is another place you can also use your post processor and check here. In fact, this may even be easier to check than going over to the techn technology database at all. Um, you just make sure you've got the right mill, and then some things that people will do is they'll kind of click on one thing and then hit OK. That doesn't actually do anything. You have to click on something you want to change and then click Select first, and that will update what you have. So like this, only then, once I click Select, does my active processor change. See, it still says that uh, this up here. Once I hit Select, it's changed. You've got to make sure you do that if you are making these changes. Most of the menus in SolidWorks Cam will work that way, where you have to select something. And then you have to click to the click the select button. You can't just click OK and move on. Um, that should be about good from there. The next thing that we need to do is define some coordinates. So as you see right now, we've got our x, y, and z axes, but they're not in the right place. What we want is our z axis to go directly up, our x to go where it is, and our y to go through this way down the line. So what we're going to do is on uh, coordinate system. We're going to do a user-defined system around an entity, an entity, and we're going to say that entity is this bottom left corner. Uh, most machines operate on the bottom left corner, um, so that's always a good standard to go with. From here, we click on the axes that we want. So I'm going to do X and Y. You see, though, our Y and our Z are now flipped. So we can click on the Y arrow here, and that flips our Y axis over, and that also is going to flip our Z axis. Sometimes you've got to play with this a little bit. Um, you know, you flip back and forth, you've got to uh, take a little time to make sure it's set up correctly. But this is super important that you have these axes in the right place or the rest of your part will not cut properly at all. Now that you're there, you're going to go to Stock Manager, and this is where you tell your software what you're actually cutting out of. So right now, it thinks we have a box that is a piece of metal that is the same size as our part exactly. And that sometimes is the case. Like maybe if we had a four by four by one uh, piece of metal and we wanted to cut this hole out of it, this is perfect. But let's say we had a piece that was eight inches by eight inches instead. Uh, and maybe it was a, a one and a half inches tall as opposed to just one inch tall. So we needed to cut the whole perimeter of this piece out and we need to uh, cut down the face of it so that it's the right size. What we can do is change our height settings here um, and uh, give a bounding box to our part. But before we do that, we want to make sure we move over to the coordinate system that we had. On the origin here, you can see this is that original co coordinate system that works like this. If we switch it over to that FCS, that is that coordinate system that we defined, it goes back to where we, the way we want it to be. From here, um, you can click on these uniform X and uniform Y buttons. And what that does is it grays out the X negative direction, which all that means is if I add two inches to the one way or one direction in the X, it automatically populates the second direction in the X as well. Same thing for the Y. If we want to make this eight by eight, then that should be good. It tells us what size we have down here, which is kind of handy. And then on the Z, oftentimes you don't want to have this selected because you're not going to add depth to the Z negative direction. All you want is that little extra height. So let's make this half an inch, um, and it should be good from there. From here, you can set this to be your default if you want, um, but I would ask that you not mess with default settings um, 
most of the time you are going to go in and change these yourself. So if you set it to default, you're probably going to just mean that it's going it's just going to mean that someone else has to come change it later. So don't mess with the default buttons uh, pretty much ever on most of our machines. Um, but it's especially important in SolidWorks CAM because there's a lot of setup that goes in beforehand and it can be somewhat uh, difficult to get things set up properly once you've changed these settings. But now that you're here, uh, your coordinate system's in the right place, your stock is set to the right size, you are good to go. You can also change your material here, but that's not normally important. Um, now that you're done with that, the last thing we have to do before we're actually ready to start telling it uh, what to cut is the setup. So click setup, click mill setup, and then from here you can see it thinks that we're going to be cutting from this face here, moving this way. And that's because it's using that original coordinate system that we gave it, uh, or that, that it populated itself with, rather than the one we set up on our own. So to fix that, what we have to do is click on the face that is the top of our part. So this for us right here, this is our top, um, and that, that little arrow tells us exactly where it's going to cut from. Um, if you don't do this step and you try to do the rest of our cuts, uh, it will end up thinking the part is turned sideways and doing all the cuts from the wrong angle, oftentimes making stuff like this hole completely impossible. So it's really important that you don't miss this step. From here, uh, this is the easiest way to do all of the really simple cuts, like the perimeter and the face. So what we're going to do is click on face and perimeter, and the face is going to be what cuts that stock down to the right height that we want it to be. It's going to cut that highlighted blue face all the way down to that height. And then the perimeter is just that. It's going to cut around the perimeter. From here, you can change uh, whether you want the, the cut to be finished or really coarse. Um, generally speaking, whatever its default settings are, so it's finished most of the time, is exactly what you should be using. It's really only in special situations where you really want to be changing these things at all. Now that you're here, you're good to go. From here, the rest of the process is relatively very simple. Um, these four buttons here, extract machinable features, generate operation plan, generate toolpath, and simulate toolpath, are going to be what you use for most of the rest of your work. And then the last step will be post-processing and saving it to a file that you can then send off to your mill. The first thing, though, is going to be to extract machinable features. So this is going to look at the part, and it's kind of the nice thing about SolidWorks Cam is it does most of the stuff for you. It looks at this part and tries to decide what features there are that need to be cut. Um, for us, it's pretty easy. It's mostly just this big hole. So we'll do extract machinable features, and it figures out there's a face because our stock is higher than the top face that we have here. It knows we have a perimeter because we set that to, to be there. The phase and perimeter are both only there because we set them there in our original setup. Um, if we had not checked those boxes, these would not be there, and all we would have is the hole here. Now, currently it says hole drill, as if it's going to just drill one large drill bit down through that hole. But once we go on to make an operation plan, it will self-populate with the bits that we have available in the tool crib for this machine. And it will realize that it doesn't have a bit large enough to do that and automatically change its plan to something that is actually possible with the bits available. When, once you click on that, now it's populated again with more stuff. The face is still there, but this time it's given itself tools for every job. And so it's kind of starting to figure out how it wants to do all of this. Um, if From here, if you realize that it wants you to use a tool you don't have, you can go in and actually change your definition. The easiest way to do that is, let's say, um, I'll just go back to make sure I have a good example here, but let's say my face, it wants me to use a two inch face mill. And maybe I don't have one. Maybe the biggest mill I have is uh, much smaller than that. Um, so this one that it's trying to use here, it's really long and wide. I don't have that. My biggest mill is this three quarter inch flat end. So if I wanted to use that instead, I just have to select it and then actually click the select button and then click OK to replacing the corresponding holder. Um, for most machines, all of the bits will be the same, and in the Tormac, we will have a tool crib that already includes all the bits we have available, so that shouldn't be a problem. It still, though, is important to know how to change the bit in case you want to do something specific with the bit, make sure it doesn't get in the wrong place, or you're using a, a rounded bit in, in a place that it doesn't want to, or that kind of thing. Um, it's always good to know how to do this, but click, click yes to there. 
Uh, from here, you can make changes to these, but we ask that you don't. Uh, once again, these are changing our default tool settings, and on the dig computers, they will already be populated with exactly what we want them to be. So making these changes can not only cause more work for us where the machines don't work right, but it can also break things where if you set this to be a smaller diameter than it is, and then the machine tries to run with it, and you put in it, you put in a bit that's larger than the machine thinks is there, it can run that bit into things when it thinks it has extra space and is clear. So it's really important that this is all correct, so please don't change it. From there, though, you're good to hit OK. Um, now that you've got the, the bits there the way you want them to be, the next thing you do is generate a toolpath. This step in particular can take a little bit for a computer, so it's possible that you click on this and it loads a little slowly. Um, you'll see for this one it ran pretty quick, but sometimes for larger cuts, especially if you've got rounded edges where it's got to do very, very small steps down to try to get that rounded edge to look as clean as possible, it can take a long time to actually process this part. But from here, you'll see, you can actually see in this yellow path where the tool is going to go for our highlighted bit here. So I click on this one instead. This is our perimeter. It's going to go in here and go around and then come out. Um, so all of these lines tell you exactly where the bit's going to go. Now, seeing this, I am not a huge fan of how far apart all these lines are. What this means is every time it does a cut, it's going to go in this far before it tries again. And I think that's kind of a long, that's, that's a long distance to go in. I would rather not make such a, uh, a deep cut per a pass. So instead, I'm going to go in here and go to um, NC. Um, I, I'm sorry, into contour. Sometimes it changes based on which, uh, which type of cut you're doing. And you can change the first cut amount and max cut amount to be lower than they are. So right now they're at percentages, but if I want, I can change them over to... Uh, inch measurements. Sometimes percentages are nice because it goes based on the diameter of your bit. If you've got a larger bit, you can make a larger cut, so this is handy. Um, but maybe I think this is too big, and I want to I want to take it down to just 10% of where it is instead. Now that I've done that, um, I can hit OK, and you'll see it's got a lot more cuts here. Uh, this is much safer. It's going to be much easier on the bit and much less likely to fail. But it also, as you can see, has added a ton of extra cuts. So this, this will take much longer to do. You can see this individual toolpath going around the perimeter is set to take 21 minutes. Um, and that's not including any of the other things we have here. Luckily, this, this will be the largest cut we've, we've make, uh, that we make because it goes all the way down. But it still is not optimal for us um, that it's super long. So you've kind of got to play with how high you want it and how long you want the cuts to take. Um, that said, it's always important that you edge on the side of caution. So don't rush parts um, and don't rush cuts. If it's going to take a long time, sometimes it just has to, and that's okay. Um, you've got to just be ready for it to take a long time to finish. Uh, from there, though, now that we've generated our toolpath, we are technically done. This could be exactly how we want it to be, and we're good to go. But to check, I always want to simulate the toolpath. And then if your setting for speed is maxed, I'll do it. And you see it runs through really fast. You can't really watch what's happening. It's a little too much. So I always like to do one below, go back to the beginning, and then you can watch the part as it cuts and just see what it does. This is really helpful where if your machine is making a mistake but it doesn't recognize it, you can look and double check that nothing is wrong. Uh, as an example, I recognized a problem in this um, where right now it's cutting the face, it's cutting the perimeter out, um, which means that this face, or this part is going to be free floating or sitting there in the, in the machine, not held down by anything. Um, but it is still doing jobs on the inside of the part after we're done. Um, so that's a problem because when it tries to do that center hole, if it's already cut the edge, this inside bar part is going to just move around and it won't be able to finish that inside cut. So instead, I'm going to take this face um, that I'm going to be doing all the way around and I'm moving it to the very bottom. So now we do the face cut, we do that center hole, make the hole bigger, fin uh, finalize that hole, clean it up a little bit, and then do the edge. From here, we can simulate it one more time, make sure we're good, uh, and if everything looks okay, we are good to go ahead and post-process.
on really long cuts, sometimes it's helpful to speed this process up, especially if you know what most of it looks like. Some ways to do that, just some tips for how to do that, is you can increase the number of moves to update to update the display. Um, even though the speed setting is the same, it's basically going five times as fast now, um, which isn't helpful for cuts like this one, but it's great for when you're doing lots of really, really fast cuts. Um, you'll see as an example, when we start to do the perimeter or the inside bits here, that part is going much faster even if the large sweeping motions aren't going as fast. So rather than increasing my speed setting to maximum, I like to update my, uh, up, uh, increase my setting for updating the display. Um, that kind of helps it go, go along faster without causing issues as far as running out of information where you're missing stuff as you go. Uh, from here though, we're good to go ahead and click that OK button and then the, the last step, assuming everything is okay and you like where it is, you just click post process. From here, I've already got a test part because um, I just did this a second ago, but I'll do test part two, give it whatever name you want. Make sure that the file type is the what you want you want it to be. Um, we'll have it automatically defaulting to the correct thing for the Tormac. It'll, it'll have the Tormac G code uh, name in this file type. Um, but it's no, it's always going to be a text or .cnc or .nc. Um, one of these is always what you're looking for. Um, you're never going to have other things from there. But from there, you click Save. Uh, it's not done yet, though. You actually have to run all of the G-code. And now this is the actual generation of that G-code. And you can see here, it's taken our instructions for the computer and turned them into text where it's telling us, it's telling the machine where to go. All of these are going to be instructions and coordinates for where to move the machine to as it makes these cuts. Sometimes these files can be really, really big as you get larger and larger cuts. Uh, this one's not super large, so it didn't take a super long time. But for really long cuts, this can take upwards of like five to ten minutes to process this whole thing. So don't be frustrated if this software takes you a while um, just for actually running all of the program on the machine. Sometimes it takes a while to do that and that's just okay. Uh, if you need, you can open up the G-code in SolidWorks CAM NC Editor. This basically opens up this text document in a fancy editor for you, makes it a little easier to navigate if you need to make changes. Um, if you're using the Tormac though, please don't do that. Changing the G-code, just like changing all the other settings, can break the machine or at the very least, ruin the part that you're trying to cut and make it so that it doesn't cut properly or, it don't, or that it doesn't cut at all. Uh, so we're going to uncheck that box, though, and we're good from here. we got to click that OK, and that's what actually saves the file. All right, so from here, you have a post-processed part. Your file is saved, and you're ready to send it off to your machine. So you're done with SolidWorks Cam until you're ready to make something new. And with that, it is the end of our video. Uh, don't be afraid to leave a comment down below, especially if you have any questions or you want to hear about anything specific. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but thanks for watching.